Is that better? Yeah. Okay, so welcome again. Um, yeah, I have to uh, skip ahead a little bit in the schedule because um, of the practical assignment where you need texture mapping. So we'll cover texture mapping today. But before we do that, just a short uh, recap to give you a kind of uh, to to kind of uh, review on where we are. So uh, <clears throat> we learned about, for example, about vectors that we can represent points with vectors. We learned that we can use those points to represent triangles. We talked about last time how we can use matrix multiplication to transform those triangles. And at the very beginning, we also talked a little bit about shading. We introduced a very simple shading model where we said, if we, for example, take the triangle as a plane, we can calculate the normal vectors to that plane or to that triangle based uh, for the vertices. And then we can calculate these, uh, these vectors here, the I vector and the L vector, L for light, E for the E vector for I. And um, then we can, with this simple shading model, we can create some color and we know what color to put on that vertex. But of course, we do not only want to put color on a vertex, we also want to put this on the whole triangle. And you already did this in the programming assignment, but we never talked about so far how to actually do this or how we can do this, uh, model this uh, mathematically. And the most straightforward and most simple way is a linear interpolation. Of course, if all the vertices on a triangle have the same color, then it's pretty much clear all the, tri then the, color, the pixels in between that represent the triangle also have the same color. But if the vertices have different color, then we have to put the color somewhere in there. Uh, we have to kind of decide what kind of color we give the pixels in between. And linear interpolation is pretty simple. I think the term uh, already appeared a couple of times without really explicitly explaining it. So this is why, why I have it here again. A linear interpolation is basically if you have uh, two values, like two vectors uh, a and b, for example, here, then you sum them up and give them a weight. And this weight is, um, for example, if um, <coughs> So uh, the, the linear interpolation is basically a weighted sum of two values. In our case, for example, we can choose two vectors, A and B, and the values and the, uh, the vectors are weighted with a certain weight, which is linear, which is, that's why it's called linear interpolation. And for example, in this case, we say uh, one is the weight of one is T and the other, uh, the weight of the other vector is one minus T. And if you think about this, if you have T between zero and one, then uh, these weights are always add up to one. So it's always kind of the same, uh, uh, the in, in between, the value is always kind of in between. For example, if A and B are scalar values and we choose T a half, then this is exactly how we calculate the average. If you look at it in terms of vectors, if we have a vector A here and a vector B here, then for example, for T equals two, third, we get this blue vector here, then this is one minus t, which is then one third, which is one third of this vector a. And then the sum of them is this vector in between. And you see here the relationship between these two. This is about uh, two third of this distance. This is about one third of this distance. So you see by varying this, va of, uh, this value t, you can basically move between those two vectors and get all the vectors in between. And by going in constant steps, you get then linearly interpolated values. So this is uh, pretty similar to this one exercise that you had in the uh, tutorial and one of the first tutorials with this parametric equation, because there you also have this parameter t, although in that case, it was basically walking along the line. And in this case, it's uh, like walking between two vectors. But of course, these don't necessarily have to be two vectors that represent points like I kind of implicitly assumed here. But these vectors are, this can be numbers that represent anything. For example, we can take a three-dimensional vector and interpret the coefficients of the vector as RGB values. And then we have a color A and the color B, and we can interpolate, that is, get a smooth transition from one color to the other by constantly making like the ingredient of one color less by increasing t uh, by uh, like the ingredient of one color more color B increases by increasing T and the same ratio color A decreases by the value one minus T and then we can color it. So we have our, our colors at the vertices. For example, let's call them C1, C2 and C C3. And I'm making it a vector now because we have three color values, red, green and blue. And then we can do a linear interpolation between these two colors here. So this is the first step here. 
one is between two vertices we interpolate here of course we can also interpolate here between c2 or in c3 or in the other direction it doesn't matter it will give the same result and that way we can color the edges of the vertices uh, of the, the triangle but of course we also want to know what's in well, how, what color to put there in between and that we can do by also interpolating between the uh, values here, a lot, the color values that we have now here along the line. So while we are walking here and putting color on our edges, we can also at the same time, we always get two corresponding values here with the same t value and then we can interpolate between them as well. So we have now a fully colored triangle that is kind of has a smooth transition of the color values. Um, <clears throat> We will learn this, uh, I will talk about this a little bit more later in how we do this and how it can be done efficiently and what problems there are, for example, with funk shading and so on. But we will, as I said, do this later. So for today, it's just uh, was important to know about the linear interpolation, how we can use it, for example, to create colors. And we'll see how we can use it for other things as well later. Good. Um, yeah, so we know now how we can model and create triangles, how we can transform them, how we can put smoothly color on the triangle sh uh, surface. And uh, that should give us the possibility to make very complex graphics because if, the, if we make the triangles very, very small, we can basically model almost everything by a triangle. We just need enough triangles. But of course, if yeah, the image of the data projector is horrible, um, that's a piece of wood. Just believe me and uh, look it up when you download the slides. Yeah, sorry. Um, so this is basically a, a piece of wood. And you know, if you know, a wooden structure is very uh, complex or it, it is kind of regular, but it has a complexity because there is no like structure, no, no f constant pattern in there. So modeling this with triangles would be a total overkill. It's hard to model from a mathematical point of view in the first place because there is not much regularity. And secondly, it is uh, a performance overkill to draw so many triangles. And this is uh, one of the motivations for a technique called texture mapping, which is what we want to talk about today. And the idea is basically to say, well, we have this nice image of a, tr of a, of a piece of wood. Um, why should we bother modeling it? Why don't we just take this image and glue it on our object? And this is, you can do this with one tile and put it on an object, or you can if you have a tile that is kind of constant at the end or fits together at the end. If you combine it, then you can draw a very large image, which again, you can hardly see, but just believe me, this looks like a tile set of woods. And uh, I actually purposely left a little distance here because I was uh, trying to illustrate that these are simple tiles of this pattern, of this texture. But uh, of course, if we do it in practice, we have to make sure that they fit to each other so you don't see it. So you get the illusion of a constant field that is uh, just a whole big piece of wood by using the trick of repeating this single, single pa uh, texture pattern over and over again. And this is exactly what we want to talk about today, how we can take these, uh, how we can create these textures that we do not get these kind of artifacts and so on. Good. Yeah, so I think the basic idea of uh, texture mapping is pretty simple. We have an object and instead of coloring the object, we just put the texture on it like you see here at the bottom. Yeah, this is easier to see. See here you have the wall and the grass and the sky, but they look just one single color. But if you put an image there of a wall, a grass and a sky, then it looks much more realistic. Good. So, um, yeah. So the, the basic idea is basically with an index, with an image that you put on an object, but of course there are other possibilities, other ways of texturing. And one of the major distinctions with, that we make with texturing when we do texture mapping is to distinguish between a 2D and a 3D texture. And the image here illustrates it quite well. A 2D uh, texture is something similar to an image. So you can put it, glue it on an object or like a, a gift wrapping when you make a gift paper over a, a gift. And um, <clears throat> the other thing is sometimes research, uh, uh, referred to as carving. The technical term is solid or volume texturing because we have a volume that represents some sort of pattern, structure, texture, and then we carve our object out of that texture. Good. So. Um, 
but don't be confused here. This I think this can be very confusing. I'm also always confusing this. Um, correct me if I say something wrong. We have a 3D object, but we have a 2D texture and a 3D texture. And later I will also use 2D objects to explain it because 2D objects are easier to draw and easier to explain. And sometimes we're also dealing with 2D data. So uh, make sure you don't get confused here. So let's start with 3D texturing. So we have, uh, yeah, you see it here, it's structured 3D texturing and then later 2D texturing and then other forms of texturing. Good, so let's start with 3D texturing. Let's start with a very specific case where we actually don't even have a texture, but we have a procedure that can easily create this texture. So we have the teapot. I hope, I think this looks familiar to you. But you see this teapot has a stripe pattern and the stripe, because it is kind of a regular texture, can be easily created with a mathematical function. So we use a so-called procedural texturing approach. Procedural because we have, we do not really store the texture somewhere and then put it on the object, but we have a mathematical function that calculates is the color of an object based on uh, 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 for that particular texture. So if we have, for example, this teapot and we say, okay, we have one spot here on the teapot and we want to know what kind of color do I have to put here, then I do not take a texture and put that color from the texture there, but I take this texture or this function here that takes the x, y and z coordinate of that point and gives me, calculates me the corresponding color. It sounds probably a little weird now, but uh, if you see an example, then you will see that this is actually very simple, and pretty straightforward. And the example is this first case here where we have a texture, a stripe pack texture along the X axis. Um, be careful here. I took these images from some uh, SIGGRAPH uh, talk where they use the, the Y axis to the top. I usually use the Z axis to the top, so it uh, could be kind of confusing. Just be careful. Um, so we have this procedure here and I'm claiming now that this procedure calculates exactly this teapot here where we have this stripe texture, texture along the x-axis. So color zero is uh, red and this is white. I just wanted to make it more general. That's why, why the procedure says zero and one. So uh, we see here, we get a, a point here, x, y, uh, this, this, the coordinates of a point p, x, p, y, p, z, p. But then we only look at the x axis, which kind of seems intuitive because it only changes along the x axis. And then we check if the sign is larger than zero. If yes, we return red. If not, we return white. Now, if you look at what the sign looks like, where it is larger than zero, we get red. Where it is smaller than zero, we get white. That is actually a line pattern. And if you look at this in 3D, so again, this is the uh, X axis, this is the Y axis, and this is the Z axis. So if you look at this in the X Z plane, you see that again, you get this line pattern and you can easily imagine, now I haven't drawn that yet because drawing in 3D is always difficult. But if you look at this, what a point here would deliver here, it is obviously clear that you get these kind of, yeah, like blocks here, vertical blocks with the color red, red, and also here. And you can easily understand, I think, why when we put a point on the teapot in into this procedure, we get the corresponding color value, either red or white, and that we get indeed a line stripe pattern here on the teapot. And of course, we can do this also in the other direction. So for example, if we look into the set axis, which is that direction, then we just replace the X P with the Z P here. And then we get instead of a pattern like this, we get a pattern like this. So we get this teapot here. And I think it should be easy to figure out what we need to change here if we want to achieve this pattern. Now uh, we can also use this. So you see, this is a very simple thing, a simple way, simple way to create this nice texture here on the teapot. We can also continue here and make more complex functions. This is still a pretty simple function. I just put in here the XP is larger than zero and ZP larger than zero, basically the combination of the two previous. And if you remember in the first one, we had these stripes here. In the second one, we had these stripes here. So you could imagine now how the image looks like if both of them have to be larger than zero. And also this should help you to imagine why, how we could, for example, get a 3D checkerboard pattern if we want that in our 3D space. So we then basically have to think about 
look into this direction because then of course also along this, uh, the y-axis it's changing. So, uh, and if you're wondering why why this question is here, then I like to remind you that the deadline for the second practical assignment is on June 8. Good. Yeah, so you see we can create some very nice uh, things with that. Um, very easy. Of course, we can also do it in a way that we do a variation with the with the width, because if you do it with the sign, of course, the width between the stripes or the length the, of the, the width of the stripes is always P. But if we want to have random uh, 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 size, we can vary it, vary, vary this by adding a weight factor here. Um, and uh, I will not go into the details here because I think this is something, since you're doing some procedural texturing in the practicals anyhow, I think you should just take this and then play around with it and, and see a little bit what the effect is and then also try to understand, of course, why you get this kind of effect and think about your own new ideas. Same for here. Again, I will not go into the details. Um, try try this uh, at home or in or in BBL. 175, of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the idea of this here is that we want to not have a strict stripe pattern, but we want to have a smooth transition from one color to the other. So, and the idea here is, um, if you look at this here, this is basically the linear interpolation that I introduced at the beginning. So we have two colors, and then we have a weight where we add them up. Now, if we just choose a weight between zero and one, like I did before, we get a really straight line. So if we, for example, here we have, if this is color one and this is color two, and if we would actually mix those colors, we have always here one color one, and then we have color two, and then we have color one. So it's very strict, either one or the other. If we do it like a linear, strictly linear interpolation, then we get, if this is color one and this is color two here, then we get first, we have only color one, then this part gets reduced, then we have fully, color two, then we have fully color one again, and then fully color two. So we see we get a, like a sharp transition where we get constantly from one color to the other. And the idea of using the sign here is basically to make this a little smoother that we have the ingredients of color one and color two a little different, uh, a little, uh, the, the, the transition a little smoother. Um, so so is it clear what I mean by this this which we're, we're drawing here, the idea is basically, if you think about it, like you have real paint and you're mixing the paint, then the, the ratio from here gives you, at one point, at one position here, you get the ratio, this is how much of C1 you put in, and this is how much of C2 you put in, and this is then along this x-axis, and then you see, of course, if this decreases, then you get more ingredients of this color, so it gets, in this case, darker or lighter. Good and uh, yeah, then you also if you if you th no, uh, understand this, then you can also realize, for example, why we need this one plus sign because the sign is the distribution here. But if we want to have it between one and zero, like we want the weights have t between zero and one, then we have to shift it up and divide it by two. Good. All right, yeah, so um, as I said, this is often called uh, solid or volumetric texturing because we have a volume and then we either create this volume by a procedure. So if we have this teapot here, we use a function f of x, y, z equals c. So we get a color by putting this particular point x, y, z here into this uh, function and we get the color value. Alternatively, we could of course also store, pre-store a 3D texture in the same way as we store an image, we can store a 3D texture. So for example, if an artist sits down and creates me this nice marble texture and a 3D model of this marble texture that I really have a three-dimensional array, I could just look up in that array and don't have to calculate this value, which of course makes sense if uh, the array uh, contains, if the texture contains a structure that is not easy to calculate. So I could also just, oops, just look at the right position here, or if I have a 2D image that I basically then expand in 3D in a similar way as we did with the stripe pattern here. So you see, this is basically uh, just a stripe pattern here that you see. And if we extend this in 3D, which is basically just ignoring the third coordinate, we, oh. 
we also get like a block of stripes here, similar to previous in the previous case where we calculated it. So we can also use a 2D image to create a 3D texture. So this is again, for example, one of the points where I often get confused between 2D and 3D. Good. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and the basic idea is then to have a pre-calculated texture, either 2D or 3D, and then do a lookup. So we have a point and then we know a position where we have to look up in the texture. And that's exactly a difficult part. We have to create a mapping between the texture, between the coordinates on the teapot or on our object and the texture. So let's look at 2D textures first. So we have an image, let's say this image here, uh, which has, uh, or this is our texture. And this is then our, uh, our object. Let's assume we have, for example, a triangle here. So this is our triangle object and now we want to put that texture onto that triangle so we have a point here which is point let's say call it uv which is then with respect to the triangle coordinates in the triangle actually when i draw it like this it's probably better to use this as uv and not that one so this here is uv something in between and now we want to have a mapping function that maps this pixel oh it's here sorry pixel to so-called texels. When we have textures, we sometimes talk about texels. So in this texture then has, this should actually be C, I, J. So this is the color that we have here at position I and J. Good. So the difficult question is now how we can get such a mapping function. And of course, there are endless ways to do this. And one pretty straightforward and often used case is, like we said, uh, you saw at the beginning with this uh, wood example so we have to assume we have a triangle and we want to tile this wood piece on the triangle and we first have to create the tiles and we do this for example by we can do this by just removing the integer portion of u and v so we have a value in between here so this here is about i don't know 2.2 .2, and here it's uh, one point yeah, also 1.2 and then if we remove the integer portion u and v become 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 so we have some values here between 0 and one, and now we want to map them to this i and j. And uh, of course, when we map them to this uh, texture array, we might not end up at a position. I, uh, the, the, the mapping is pretty straightforward because we just have a square on one side and we have a rectangle on the other. So we just map the width and the height of each other to each other, like you did, I think, in the first uh, tutorial with this window mapping exercise. Um, but of course, then we do not end up at one particular position in the in the array, but we probably end up somewhere in between. So if we have here, if for example, this is our color Cij, then this is Cij uh, plus uh, I, I plus one J, and this here is I plus one J plus one, and here. And then we end up somewhere here in the middle. Now, the question is, what color do we assign to this pixel here based on this position in the texel array? And what we do is we can, of course, just take the one here at the bottom, which we do by using this so-called floor function, which basically is the highest integer value that is smaller than the value inside of the floor function. So if we're here, we always choose this one here. So I have a nicer image here where I can also read, oops, sorry, where I can also read the, the indices. This is our, our function that we use, and then we get the color value by basically just choosing the one here. And this is sometimes called a nearest neighbor interpolation because we take, of course, the nearest neighbor. Of course, if we are here, then this is not the nearest neighbor. We could change that also that we say we really take the nearest neighbor. We can use a different function. And then all these here are assigned to this color value. But in the end, it will lead the same result. It's just a little bit shifted because all the points here are also assigned then to this value. So no matter how we do it, we will always get these larger blocks of squares, 
which might work fine for a lot of textures, but for a lot of textures, uh, but it can also create a lot of artifacts because we have sharp transitions between the colors at the corners, at the, at the, at the change of the, the color values. Um, and of course, we already learned today about how we can interpolate between colors. So why not use that? Why not do a linear interpolation between the colors? But we have four colors here that are around this point here that we want to uh, uh, put some color on. So we have to do a linear interpolation between four points. So we have here the four, uh, this is our point. These are our four neighboring colors. And we want to have now an interpolation between those four colors for a pixel that gives a good color for a pixel at this position. So we take the four colors and similar to the linear interpolation, we add it up and each color gets like a weight value that specifies how much this color value contributes to our final color. And uh, you see here we have two weights because we are in two dimensions. So we have not only twice as much colors, but we have also two weights, which is why it's called bilinear interpolation. And if you look at what the weights look like, so this is the, the integer part, and this is the whole value. So this here is basically the part after the comma. And if you look at the image, then you will see that this is exactly u dash. This is one minus u dash. This is v dash. And this is one minus v dash. Now, if you look at how this function here is defined how the weights are used here. Let's look, for example, at this case here. U dash V dash is the weight associated with this color. Now, what happens if U dash and V dash gets larger? If U dash and v, no, what happens if this point is very close to this one? U dash and V dash get larger, of course, and they have their largest value when they're the closest to this particular color value. So the closer they are to this color, the closer this, uh, the larger this weight gets. Same for the others. The closer the point is to this color, the larger the weight that is listed here with this color. Where is it? This one is it? That's the one. Uh, the larger it gets here. So you see, obvious. It kind of makes sense. It's a linear interpolation. So depending on the distance in a linear way, the, color, the closer it is to a certain color, the more this color is considered in calculating the final color. Good. So this was the, the 2D case, but of course we also want to do this in 3D. So if we have a 3D texture, the formula becomes a little more complicated. It actually becomes so complicated that I didn't bother even writing it down because I was too lazy. Uh, you can look it up in a book and I also didn't bother, bother writing it down because it's really a straightforward generalization of the 2D case. In 2D, we have to consider four colors. In 3D, we have to consider eight colors. And then we have, we need three weights to model that. But again, you see the closer the point is to a particular color, the larger the weight gets or the further away it is, the smaller the weight gets. So the influence of this particular color in the final color gets larger. So it's really pretty straightforward. Good. Yeah, so um, we know now how we can uh, can do some, some linear interpolation and do some, some uh, uh, matching between the, the objects and the textures and create some nice effects with that. But um, still we have, um, no, <laughs> let's start over. Uh, we, we used, uh, we, we know now how we can put textures, images uh, on an object and also know how we can use procedures to create stuff. We saw this with, with this, um, with this line structure. But uh, of course, there are also other things in nature that look a little more chaotic and not as regular, for example, as the initial stripe texture that we had. For example, there is a wood. Yeah, this is a little bit better visual. At the bottom, you can see it well. We have this marble structure on the teapot. And this is something, a texture that is kind of yeah noisy. It is, uh, in one way, it is kind of regular, but it is not not really strictly regular, but it is kind of chaotic. So if you look at it at a, as a whole, it looks kind of 
regular, but if you look at a small detail, there is seems to be no rule to create it. And these are kind of textures that we also, of course, want to create when we want to have realistic images. And uh, one approach to do this is the so-called Perline noise. So to, to motivate this or to understand this, Perline noise is basically, yeah, it's just a, a kind of a trick to, to create these textures. So uh, if you look at it first, you see a lot of like big formulas that can be very, uh, uh, irritating if you're not that strong in math, but if for that, what I want to do today is like look into this formula and see why it is there and what it really means and what the effect of it is, and then you will see it's actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple to understand. But let's think about how we can create such a structure. So we want to have something like a noise, but not too 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 noisy. So we want to have like random values there, but kind of structured. So the first idea could be to just, just put random noise there, just put a random color at each point. Of course, this would cre uh, create a lot of noise and a lot of randomness, so it would look more like white noise that we have on TV, but not really like a nice texture like the marble on the teapot. So the uh, the uh, the second idea is we could say, yeah, let's put random noise at the, at the points and then let's do some smoothing to even it out. And that, yeah, if you do it easily, then it doesn't work. If you do it in a way that it produces good results, it's way too computationally expensive. So it really doesn't work as well. But we know how to do linear interpolation. So we could also say, why do we not just create a lattice and then, or, or a grid, and then at each lattice point or each grid point, we take a random number and then we interpolate between that number. That should give us like an intermediate thing between randomness, because we have random uh, colors at the corners, and between more uh, constant uh, change, because we have the linear interpolation between it. And it's pretty, uh, basically a good idea, but the problem is if we do that, the lattice becomes too obvious. So it looks still too structured, too artificial. You will not be able to create something like this marble structure on the teapot with this kind of approach. And the idea of Perline noise, so Perline is the guy who invented it, uh, the idea of Perline noise is basically use this kind of uh, 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 lattice approach, but do it a little bit different. Use some yeah, tricks or hacks to uh, that kind of uh, solve this problem that that these uh, that first of all the the linear interpolation makes the transition too obvious, too smooth, and also because you have the grid with the lattice points, the uh, the, uh, the, the structure of the lattice is kind of visible because you always have local maxima and minima at these grid corners. And what Perline does is basically dealing with these uh, two problems. And the third problem, which is that if you store this in a three-dimensional array, these random vectors, you have uh, a storage problem, an efficiency problem. And this is why he has this uh, basic, where Perline noise has basically these three ideas or three steps. One is to use a virtual 3D array based on a 1D array of random unit vectors and a hashing function. So again, this is just to uh, save storage. So we have a 3D array of random vectors, but it's not a re we don't store a real 3D array, we just uh, store a 1D array and do it in a way with a hashing function that it basically creates something that looks like a 3D array or behaves like a 3D array. And uh, to deal with the problem that if we have, if you think about it, if you if you have this grid structure here, then you have the local and do an interpolation between these, then you have the local maxima and minima always here. So no matter how random these colors are, you will always have something that kind of looks uh, extends around here. So there is always like these spots here, and that could can look very regular then in the, and therefore unnatural in the image. And this is basically the, 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 the step that deals with these problems by not taking random values here, but taking a random vector and then multiplying it with the UVW vector, which is the vector that points to this thing here, and then we have a random vector here. And then we take the scalar product, and you should know that the scalar product uh, delivers a scalar value. The first look at the exam showed that not everyone knows that, but yeah. Um, and uh, you also know that this depends, uh, the, the scalar product, if you have a unit vector and uv is also between 0 and 1, then the scalar is dependent on the cosine and the length of the vector. So we have a unit vector and a vector between 0 and 1 and the cosine between 0 and minus 1. So this will always deliver a value 
that is between uh, 1 and minus 1. And uh, so this is a way to create random numbers that is a little better than just using your random numbers at the corners. And then he does so-called Hermite interpolation, which is different than the linear interpolation, because like I said, if you do the linear interpolation, we already saw this with the sign example, uh, then you constantly move from one color to the other and the in, in uh, the influence of this other color linearly increases and that creates something that is too regular for a natural pattern like something like that would not appear on a marble for example. Good, so let's look into how we can do this. Let's first look at how we can create this virtual 3D array. So this uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, first of all, we, we want to create random unit vectors and we create them by using random numbers between zero and one. And then we multiply them with two and subtract one to have them between minus one and one. So this is just a calculation trick because it's easier to get them between zero and one and then multiply and, and minus one. And then we have them between minus one and one. So it means we have vectors that are in the so-called unit cube. The unit cube is a cube from minus one to one around centered around the origin. So we have all vectors. These vectors are all vectors that start here in the origin and point to some position here on this unit cube. And uh, there is a little problem when we do that. We, we could take them and then just uh, normalize them and then we have our random unit vectors. But the problem with this is because the unit, if, if you look at the unit cube, um, the, the point is, if you take a vector here and then you say you create a random vector in all directions that points to this unit cube here, you can get this vector, for example, you can get this one, but you can also get this one, you can also get this one, and you can also get this one. And because the distance from here to here is longer than the distance from here to here, you see that if you have a good random calcula a calculator for, for the random numbers, in the end, it is more likely to have, it is likely to have more values in, uh, more vectors in your random set that point in this direction than that point in this direction, because there just are more vectors in this direction. And this is a little trick here to deal with this. We just calculate, is the vector within this unit circle? And if it is, then we take it, if not, we ignore it, which basically means that in this direction, we ignore all vectors that are outside of the unit circle, which is exactly the number of vectors that we do not get in this direction. So this is just a simple trick. Good. And then we have our, our random vectors. And uh, yeah, Perline says that 550, uh, 256 are um, turn out to work quite well. And this is kind of, yeah, this, this turn out to work quite well is kind of a phrasing that uh, illustrates uh, kind of a thing with this. Uh, um, it it's sometimes feels a little weird in, in, in graphics that you, you have something and you, you show it to someone and you say, okay, we do this, this and that, and then we get this result. And the, the ultimate quality criteria is basically, it looks good because it's, uh, I mean, you, you cannot formally prove that this is something that is closer to a marble structure than something else. It's basically the ultimate criterion is looking at it and uh, does it look good, does it look natural or not? Which is also why you have sometimes approaches like this here, which uh, you could also consider a hack because it's basically a, a couple of rules of thumb that work quite well. But this is why I want to explain you today. I will, will not go too much into the details of the mathematics. I will more try to explain you why these kind of tricks actually work quite well, why there is a reason behind you. So you understand it a little bit, why you're doing all these kind of things when you implement it, and also probably get an idea about how to create, come up sometime with, with your own ideas. Good. Yeah, so we have a, a, a um, an array now of unit vectors, but uh, a one-dimensional uh, array of random unit vectors, and we want to create a 3D array of random vectors. But uh, we also don't, we, we could, of course, yeah, question? Uh, oh, the null vector, huh. I would say no, because that would be, I've never, yeah. 
Yeah, right. Uh, not, no, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, I would say you throw it away because the null vector, you cannot normal. I, I've, I've never thought about it yet, but it's, uh, it's not a unit vector. So if I just follow what's written in the book, I would not throw it away. And if I think about it, uh, because we use it to take the scalar product, First, I was, was tended to say we do not throw it away because why would we not want to have the random number zero at the end? But the UWV vector can also be zero, so we're not excluding this solution by throwing it away. That's why I would say we throw it away. Yeah. Good. And then we have our one uh, dimensional array, but we want to have a three dimensional array. And instead of like creating all those vectors to have the three dimensional array, we just take the one from that and just mix it up with a hashing function in a way that makes it look random. But you see here it's pseudo random, which means it is not really random. If you take the same numbers and put it in your function, you will always get the same result, which is why it's not random, but it looks random because the numbers look like there is no structure, no uh, construction scheme behind them. So this is why we call this a pseudo random 3D array. And the idea is basically we have G is our array of n random, fact, random vectors. Then we have this uh, function uh, phi here, which is basically just a permutation of those. And you see here we permute once, then we permute the result with the other, and then we permute this one. So this is basically just shuffling them three times to, to make it more random. And then we use, uh, we uh, which oh yeah yeah sorry i was i was confused where the p is here yeah 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 that's that's yeah so this is basically just shuffling up and then we get this this uh function gamma here that is basically our hashing function so let's uh yeah you see i also get confused about these these uh, big formulas but if you really look at it you see there is not really that much behind it so we have here our one-dimensional array here of pseudo vectors, which uh, of, of uh, random uni unit vectors, 256. And then we have a 3D array and we say we have a value here uh, with three coordinates. And then we use with three indices, i, j, k. So that's the, we want to have a value at this position. And then we use just this hashing function with i, j, k to get one of these here. So this one will probably lead to the same and this one here will also lead to the same and the one next to him, it will lead to somewhere completely else. And because we have shuffled everything and did this in a clever way, it looks like these vectors are all random. Good. So as I said, this is just a way to save, uh, uh, to not be forced to store them all. Good, and uh, yeah. Now the question is, what do we want this three-dimensional array for? And we want this, of course, like I said, to create random values at in 3D space. So we have a value on our object that we want to texture with an index UVW. We map that again to a position here. And then we have the same problem as before. We do most likely not hit a value directly, but we fall into, in this case, a cube and not a square because we're in 3D. And then we have to kind of interpolate between those values here at the end. So we take all the color values here, also these here, and then we want to interpolate with them and uh, to create some noise. So this is just a, a summary of this. We have created our one dimensional uh, array now, and then we have in a, uh, we have the, the random vectors here. We can make, can multiply them. So this is, if this is our vector u, V and this is our random vector. We can build a scalar product and then we get uh, S, let's call it Z, I, J here. We get a value here, a random value, which is what we want. And then we can do the interpolation with it. And that is, like I said, if we do a linear interpolation, we get this smooth, relatively smooth transition, which is unnatural. So we want to have some sort of a different interpolation. And it turns out that the so-called Hermite interpolation works quite well. So let's look at this formula, which again looks quite scary at the first, but is pretty straightforward. So this is just the sum from i, from the integer part of x to the uh, uh, then i plus 1. And if you look at this, you will see this is basically just the sum over all the eight corners that we have here on a cube. So if you write this down here, you will see that you basically get here just eight 
different index combinations, which are exactly the eight color combinations that we have at the corners of the cube. So this is basically just summing up over all the colors. And this uh, uh, function uh, omega here gives us then the value for each corner or how much this corner contributes to the final color. And you see again here we have weights, like with the linear weighting before, and we have the scalar product that I already said. This is the scalar product here of our, our uh, the inner product of our random vector and the UVW vector that is here calculated. And if you look at the weights now, now you see here we don't have linear weights, but we have weights to the power of three and here power of two. So we have cubic weights. And uh, yeah, this is again one of the examples why cubic works well. It just looks good, it just works out. But if you think about how a cubic function looks like, then you can understand why most likely it looks quite good or what could be the reason why it looks so good. So if we look at the linear interpolation, like I said, if you think about this, this image again, that we have a color C1 and C2, and then at one point T here, this is the part of, if you really have paint, how much of C1 you put in and this other part is then 1 minus T how much of C2 you put in and uh, if you think about this here in this case this is the extreme case that you are directly at C1 then you get of course full C1 this is the case that you are at C2 then you get a full C2 and if you are in between, you get half of both, same as in a linear case. Also, if you are around that area, this is pretty linear. So here you get pretty much the same result. But if you're close to that color, it this color becomes much, much sooner. Um, the influence of that color becomes much sooner, stronger than in, oops, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Uh, than for than than in this case. So you see here, the further it moves away, the influence of this color drops down sooner. Whereas here, you still have a la relatively large influence of that color, although it is very close. And this kind of makes a smoother transition that is kind of more natural from uh, if you look at certain patterns that you have in nature. Good, yeah, so this is just to, to sum it up. Like I said, it looks scary at first, but there's really not that much behind it. Um, the fun part about this is, of course, then implementing it and playing around with the parameters and creating all these kind of different uh, visualizations, uh, different uh, patterns with it. Good, so that means we have the 3D texture mapping captured, and after break, we'll talk about the 2D textures.